Produced by Liang Gu, Secret Garden. Chapter 1 Nothing Remains When Mary Lennox was sent to Misselthwaite Manor to live with her uncle, everyone said she was the most disgusting looking person ever. Child. It is also true. Her face is a bit thin. The body is a bit thin, the hair is thin and light colored, and the expression is cold. She has yellow hair and a yellow face because she was born in India and was always somewhere sick or otherwise. Her father was in England and her mother was a government official who was always busy with work. Not in good health either. She was once a great beauty who only liked to attend parties and entertain herself with homosexuals. She did not want a little girl at all, and when Mary was born, she placed her in the care of an ayah and made her understand that if she wanted to please Meme Sahib, you must keep the child as far away from your sight as possible. So when she was a sickly, ugly little baby, she was shut out when she became sickly, restless, and a toddler. In her memory, she never saw anything familiar except the black faces of her ayah and other native servants, as they always obeyed her and did everything her own way, for if her crying disturbed Amiyam, Sahib, he will get angry. So when she was six years old, she became the most bossy, selfish little pig ever. The young English governess who came to teach her to read and write disliked her so much that she gave up the position after three months, when other governesses came to fill the vacancy. They always go faster than the first governess. Therefore, if Mary had not chosen to actually want to know how to read, she would never have learned the alphabet. When she was about nine years old, she woke up one swelteringly hot morning feeling very uncomfortable. She became even more upset when she saw that the servant standing beside the bed was not her Aya. Why did you come? she said to the strange woman. I won't let you stay and let my Aya come to see me. The woman looked scared, but she just stammered. Aya could have fallen into passion and beat Mary but she looked more frightened and repeatedly said that there was no way Aya had come to see Missy Sahib. That morning, there was a mysterious atmosphere in the air. Everything was going according to plan, but several local servants seemed to be missing. The servants whom Mary saw were hurried about in disgrace and panic. But no one told her anything and her Aya did not come. As time passed, she finally went out to the garden alone and started playing alone under a tree near the balcony. She pretended to be tidying up the flower garden, placing large scarlet hibiscus flowers in small mounds of soil. She became angrier and angrier as she played, mumbling what she was going to say and what she was going to scold when Sadie came back. Pig! Pig's daughter, she said because calling a local pig was the worst insult. She gritted her teeth and said over and over again when she heard her mother and a man coming to the balcony. She stood with one of them, talking in low, strange voices. Mary knew this fair-skinned young man who looked like a boy. She heard that he was a very young officer who had just arrived from England. The child stared at him but it was her mother who she stared at most. She always did this whenever she had a chance to see her mother, because her mother Mary often called her was a tall, slim, and beautiful person. Wear cute clothes. Her hair is like curly silk, she has a delicate little nose that seems to be disdainful of everything, and a pair of big smiling eyes. Her clothes were thin and flowy and Mary said they were full of lace this morning. Her clothes looked more beautiful than before, but her eyes were not smiling at all. Her eyes were big and frightened, looking at the fair-skinned male officer lovingly. Is it that bad? Oh, yes, Mary heard her say. It's terrible replied the young man in a trembling voice. Too bad, Mrs. Lennox. 
You should have gone to the mountains two weeks ago. Mem Sahib rubbed his hands. Oh, I know I should. She shouted. I only stayed to attend that stupid dinner party. What a fool I am. Just then a great wail came from her clutching the young man's arm, while Mary stood trembling from head to foot. The cries grew wilder and wilder, this was what? What is it? Mrs. Lennox asked breathlessly. Someone died. The boy officer replied. You didn't say it was your servant who died. I don't know, cried Miam Sahib. Follow me, follow me. She turned and ran into the house. Then something horrific happened, and Mary understood the mystery of this morning. Cholera broke out in its deadliest form and people were dying like flies. Aya fell ill during the night, and the servants wailed in the hut precisely because she had just died. Before the next day, three more servants were dead, and others fled in terror. There was panic all around. There were people dying in all the bungalows. In the chaos and confusion of the next day, Mary hid herself in the nursery and was forgotten by everyone. No one thought of her, no one wanted her, strange things happened, she knew there was nothing. Mary cried sometimes. Fall asleep sometimes. She only knew people were getting sick and she heard mysterious and scary noises. Once, she tiptoed into the restaurant and found it empty. Although there was a half-finished meal placed on the table, chairs and plates that seemed to have been hastily pushed back when the diner suddenly stood up for some reason. The child ate some fruit and biscuits, and because she was thirsty, she drank a glass of wine, which was almost full. The wine is very sweet. She didn't know how intense it was. Soon the wine made her drowsy, and she returned to her nursery shutting herself in again, and became very frightened when she heard the cries and the hasty footsteps in the little room. The wine made her drowsy and she could barely keep her eyes open as she lay on the bed. I didn't know anything for a long time. A lot of things happened during the few hours she slept deeply, but she was not disturbed by the sounds of crying and moving in and out of the bungalow. After waking up, she lay on the bed and stared at the wall in a daze. The house is completely still. She had never seen such silence. She heard neither voices nor footsteps, and wondered whether everyone was cured of the cholera and all troubles were over. She also wants to know who will take care of her now that her ayah is dead. There will be a new ayah. Maybe she'll know some new stories. Mary was already a very tired old man. She didn't cry because the nurse died. She didn't grieve that she was a withdrawn child who never cared about anyone. The noise, rush, and wails of cholera frightened her and made her angry. Because no one seems to remember she's alive. Everyone was too panicked to think about a little girl that no one liked. People who have cholera seem to remember only themselves. But if everyone recovered, someone would surely remember and come looking for her. But no one came. As she waited, the house seemed to grow quieter and quieter. She heard a rustling sound on the mat, looked down and saw a small snake slithering, its eyes staring at her like gems. She wasn't afraid because it was a harmless little thing that couldn't hurt her and it seemed to be in a hurry to leave the room. As she watched, it slipped through the door. How strange, how quiet, she said. It sounded like there was no one else in the bungalow but me and the snake. Almost the next minute. She heard footsteps in the yard, and then a man's footsteps. Those were the footsteps of a man, who walked into the bungalow and talked in a low voice. No one came to see them or talk to them, 
and they seem to be able to open the door and look into the room. How desolate it is! She heard a voice say, That beautiful, beautiful woman. I think so do kids. I heard there was a child, although no one had seen her. When they opened the door a few minutes later, Mary was standing in the center of the nursery. She looked like an ugly, flesh-faced little thing. Frowning because she was starting to get hungry and feeling neglected and dishonorable. The first person to come in was a large officer whom she had seen talking to her father. He looked tired and preoccupied, but when he saw her he was startled and almost jumped back. Barney. He shouted, there's a child here. Spare us a lonely child in a place like this, who is she? I am Mary Lennox, the little girl said, standing up stiffly. She found it very disrespectful for this man to refer to her father's bungalow as a place like this. I fell asleep when everyone got cholera, and I just woke up now. Why didn't anyone come? This is the child no one has ever seen. The man turned to his companions and exclaimed. She has really been forgotten. Why have I been forgotten? Mary stamped her feet and said, Why doesn't anyone come? The young man named Barney looked at her very sadly. Mary even thought she saw him blinking away tears. Poor child, he said, no one is coming. It was in this strange and sudden way that Mary found that her father and mother were gone, and they were both dead. Being taken away in the night, the few local servants who survived also died. They left the house as quickly as possible, and no one even remembered that there was a Mithi Sahib. That's why this place is so quiet indeed. There was nothing in the bungalow except herself and the rustling little snake. Chapter 2. Different paths lead to the same destination. Mary liked to see her mother from a distance. She thought she was very beautiful, but since she knew very little about her mother, she was so she hardly loves her or misses her terribly when she leaves. In fact, she didn't miss her at all because she was an autistic child who focused all her thoughts on herself, just like she always did. If she were older, she would no doubt be very anxious about being left alone in this world, but she is still very young. And she had been well cared for, and she thought she would continue to be. All she thinks about is that she wonders if she will be sent to good homes, people who will be polite to her and treat her like her ayah and other native servants did. Let her have her own way of life. She knew she would not remain in the English. Grab each other's toys. Mary hated their untidy bungalow and was so unkind to them that after a day or two no one wanted to play with her. The next day they gave her a nickname, which made her very angry. It was Bashir who thought of it first. Bashir is a little boy. He had cheeky blue eyes and a turned-up nose, and Mary hated him. She was playing alone under a tree, just like she was on the day of the cholera outbreak. She was piling soil to pave the way for the garden, and Basso came and stood beside her to look at her. Soon he became very interested. A suggestion came out of the blue. Why don't you put a bunch of rocks there and pretend it's a rockery, he said. Right in the middle, he leaned over and pointed it out to her. Go away. Mary shouted. I don't want the boy to go away. Bashir looked very angry for a moment. After a while, the teasing started again. He always teases his sisters. He walked around her, making faces, singing and laughing. On the contrary, Miss Mary, how does your garden grow, silver bells and clam shells, marigolds all in one? He sang until the other children heard it. They all laughed too, the more disobedient Mary became, the more they sang, Miss Mary, so disobedient, and from then on, 
Whenever Mary was with them, they called her Miss Mary, so disobedient. You will be sent home, Basil said to her, at the end of the week. We are very happy, I am very happy too, Mary replied. Where is home? She doesn't know where home is. Basil said with seven-year-old contempt. England, of course. Our grandmother lives there and our sister Mabel was sent to live with her last year. You can't go to your grandma. You don't have a grandma. You are going to see your uncle. His name is Mr. Archibald Craven. I know nothing about him, said Mary. I know you don't know, answered Basil. You know nothing. Girls never do. I heard my father and mother talking about him. He lives in a big, desolate old house in the country where no one comes near him. He was angry and wouldn't let them come, and if he had let them come, they wouldn't have come. They are hunchbacked and scary. Mary said, I don't believe you. She turned around and put her fingers in her ears because she didn't want to listen anymore. But she thought about it for a long time afterwards, and that night Mrs. Crawford told her that she would take a boat to England in a few days. When she went to see her uncle, Mr. Archibald Craven, who lived at Mistletoe Hall, she looked dull, stubborn and uninterested, and they didn't know what to think of her. They tried to be nice to her, but when Mrs. Crawford tried to kiss her, she merely turned her face away and stood stiffly again when Mr. Crawford patted her on the shoulder. She is such an ordinary child, Mrs. Crawford said pityingly afterwards. Her mother was a beautiful woman. Her manners were beautiful. And Mary behaved in the most unpleasant way I have ever seen a child. The children all call her Mistress Mary, and although they are very naughty, I still understand. If her mother could often take her pretty face and her pretty manners to kindergarten, Mary might also be able to learn some pretty ways. Now that the poor little beauty is gone, many people don't even know she has a child, which makes people are very sad. I believe she seldom looked at her, sighed Mrs. Crawford. After her Aya died, no one cared about the little thing anymore. Think of the servants running away and leaving her alone in that deserted bungalow. Colonel McGrew said. When he opened the door and found her standing alone in the middle of the room, he almost jumped with fright. Mary made the long journey to England in the care of an officer's wife, who was taking her children to boarding school. She was devoted to her little son and daughter and was glad to leave them with the woman whom Mr. Archibald Craven had sent to London to fetch her. The woman was his housekeeper at Misselthwaite Hall, Mrs. Medlock. She is tall and tall. The cheeks are rosy and the black eyes are sharp and lively. She wore a purple dress with black silk curtains inlaid with black tassels, and a black hat with purple velvet flowers. Her head would tremble whenever she moved. Mary didn't like her at all. But since she rarely liked other people, it wasn't a big deal, besides, it was obvious that Mrs. Medlock didn't like her very much either. She said, Oh my God! She is an ordinary little thing. We would have heard that her mother was a beauty. She didn't have much passed down, did she? lady? Perhaps she will improve as she gets older, the officer's wife said kindly. If she were not so swarthy and her expression was better, her facial features would still be pretty good-looking. The child has changed so much. She had to change a lot. Replied Mrs. Medlock. I tell you, things won't get any better for the children in Misselthwaite. They thought Mary wasn't listening because she was standing at the window of the private hotel they were visiting, a little away from them. She looked at the passing buses. Taxis and pedestrians, 
but she heard clearly and was very curious about her uncle and where he lived. What kind of place was that and what kind of person would he be? What is a hunchback? She had never seen it before. Maybe there are no hunchbacks in India. Because she has been living in someone else's house. Without Aya, she begins to feel lonely and develops new and strange ideas for her. She began to wonder why she never seemed to belong and she never met anyone even when her father and mother were still alive. The other children seemed to belong to their fathers and mothers, but she never really seemed to be anyone's little daughter. She had servants, food, and food but no one noticed her and didn't know it was because she was an annoying child. She didn't know it was because she was an annoying child, of course, she didn't know she was annoying either. She often thinks of others as unlovable, without realizing that she feels the same way. She thought Mrs. Medlock was the most disgusting person she had ever met. She had an ordinary, dark-skinned face and wore an ordinary pretty hat. The next day they set out on their journey to Yorkshire and she walked through the station with her head held high, toward the railway carriage, keeping as far away from Mrs. Medlock as possible. Because she didn't want people to think she was Mrs. Medlock's daughter. She would be very angry if others thought of her as their little daughter. But Mrs. Medlock was not at all troubled by her or her ideas. She is the kind of woman who can't stand young people talking nonsense. At least, that's what she'd say if anyone asked her. When her sister Maria's daughter was about to get married, she didn't want to go to London, but she had a comfortable, cozy home at Misselswhite Manor. The only way she can keep a well-paying housekeeper position is by immediately following Mr. Archibald Craven's orders. She didn't even dare to ask. Captain Lennox and his wife died of cholecystitis said Mr. Craven in his short, cold way. Captain Lennox was my wife's brother, and I was the guardian of their daughter. The child is to be brought here. You must go to London yourself and bring her. So, she packed the small box and embarked on the journey. Mary sat in the corner of the carriage, looking plain and anxious. She had nothing to read and nothing to see. She had a pair of thin and black gloves. S. Little hands on his knees. Her black dress made her look more gorgeous than ever, and her limp light hair fell from beneath her black wrinkled hat. Thought Mrs. Medlock, I have never seen such a sloppy child in my life. She had never seen a child sitting so quietly, doing nothing. At last, she grew tired of watching and began to speak in a rapid, stilted voice. I thought I might as well tell you a little about where you were going, she said. Do you know about your uncle? No, said Mary. Never heard your father and mother talk about him? No, said Mary, frowning. She frowned because she remembered that her father and mother had never talked to her about anything in particular. Of course, there were things they never told her. Snort. Murmured Mrs. Medlock, staring into her strange, unresponsive little face. After a moment she was silent, and then she began again. I thought I should tell you something to give you something to think about. You are going to a strange place. Mary said nothing. Mrs. Medlock also looked unhappy at her indifference but she took a deep breath and continued. No, it was just a big, spooky house that Mr. Craven was proud of in his own way, and it was spooky enough. The house is six hundred years old, on the edge of the wilderness, and has nearly a hundred rooms, most of which are closed and locked. The house has paintings, beautiful old furniture and some period items, and is surrounded by a large park. Gardens and some trees with branches hanging down to the ground. She paused and took another breath. But nothing else, 
she ended abruptly. Mary began to listen desperately. None of this sounded like India, and anything new would appeal to her. But she wasn't going to look like she was interested. It was one of the ways she was unhappy and unlovable. So she sat motionless. Mrs. Medlock said, Okay, what do you think? Nothing. I don't know anything about this kind of place, she replied. This caused Mrs. Medlock to burst into a short burst of laughter. E.Y. She said, but you are like an old lady. Don't you care? It doesn't matter, Mary said, whether I care or not. You're quite right, said Mrs. Medlock. No. I don't know why you're left at Misselthwaite Manor, unless it's the easiest way out. He won't be bothered about you, that's for sure. He's never bothered about anyone. She stopped. As if he just remembered something. His back is crooked, she said. This made him wrong. He is a taciturn young man. Before marriage, his money and big house were not valuable. Before marriage, his money and big house were not valuable. Mary's eyes turned to her, even though she didn't want to sound concerned. She had never thought that the hunchback was married, and she was a little surprised. Mrs. Medlock saw this, and as she was a talkative woman, she was more interested in going on. Anyway. It's also a way to pass the time. She is a lovely and beautiful girl, in order to get everything she wants, he can travel all over the world. No one thought that she would marry him, but she married him anyway. People said she married him for his money. But she didn't, she didn't, she said with certainty. When she died. Mary jumped involuntarily. Oh. She's dead, she exclaimed casually. She remembered a French fairy tale she had read called The Richter of Up. The story told the story of a poor hunchback and a beautiful princess, which made her suddenly become interested in Archibald Kerr. Mr. Raven was apologetic. Yes, she is dead. Replied Mrs. Medlock. It made him queerer than ever. He doesn't care about anyone. He didn't want to see anyone. He was out most of the time, and when he was at Misselthwaite he shut himself up in the West Wing, letting no one but Pitcher see him. Pitcher was an old fellow but he had taken care of him as a child and he knew his temper. And their doors were locked, a house on the edge of wilderness, whatever wilderness was, sounded dreary. A person with a crooked back also closes himself up. She pursed her lips tightly and stared out the window. The rain seemed to start falling naturally, with grey slashes and splashes flowing down the window glass. If that beautiful wife were still alive, she might be like her mother, wearing a dress full of lace and running in and out to attend various parties. Make everything cheerful. But she's gone. You don't have to hope to see him said Mrs. Medlock, because nine times out of ten you won't. Don't expect anyone to talk to you either. You have to play by yourself and take care of yourself. They will tell you which rooms you can enter and which rooms you cannot enter. There are gardens but don't wander around and poke around when you are in the house. Mr. Craven wouldn't agree to that. I don't want to hang around, said little Mary sourly. Just when she had begun to feel sorry for Mr. Archibald Craven, she suddenly began to feel less sorry for him. She felt that Mr. Archibald Craven was an unpleasant man who deserved what he deserved. All this happened to him. She turned her face to the flow. She stood in front of the window of the train carriage, looking out at the grey rainstorm, as if the rainstorm would never stop. She stared at the rainstorm for a long time, the grey in front of her eyes getting heavier and heavier, 
and she fell asleep. Chapter 3 Through the Wilderness She slept for a long time. When she awoke, Mrs. Medlock had bought a basket lunch at one of the stations, and they had some chicken, cold beef, bread and butter, and some hot tea. The rain seemed to come down harder than before, and everyone in the station was wearing wet, glistening waterproofs. The guard lit the lamp in the carriage, and Mrs. Medlock drank tea and ate chicken and beef, and was very happy until she fell asleep in the corner of the car again, and the rain splashed on the window, causing her to fall into a deep sleep. When she woke up again, it was already dark. The train stopped at a station and Mrs. Medlock was shaking her. You slept in, she said. It's time to open your eyes. We're at Sweet Station, and there's still a long way to go. Mary stood up trying to keep her eyes open. Mrs. Medlock was packing her parcel. The little girl didn't take the initiative to help her because in India. The local servants were always fetching or moving things, and it seemed fitting that others would wait on them. The station was small and no one seemed to get off except themselves. The stationmaster spoke to Mrs. Medlock in a rude, good-natured way and his pronunciation was strange. Mary later learned that it was a Yorkshire pronunciation. I see you're back, he said, you're with your children. Yes, that's her, replied Mrs. Medlock, speaking in her own Yorkshire accent, and turning her head. To Mary. How are you, madam? Okay, the carriage is waiting for you outside. A carriage stopped on the road in front of the small platform outside. Mary saw that it was an exquisite carriage, and the person who helped her get into the carriage was an exquisite footman. He had a long the waterproof hood on the jacket and hat shines in the rain. Like everything, including the burly webmaster. When he closed the door and climbed into the car with the coachman, they were driving. The little girl found herself sitting in a comfortable corner, but she did not want to sleep anymore. She sat and looked out the window. Curious to see the state of the road by which she was conveyed to the strange place of which Mrs. Medlock had spoken. She was not a timid child, nor was she very scared, but she felt that in a building with hundreds of rooms. In an almost completely closed house, a house standing on the edge of the wilderness, I don't know what will happen. What is the more, she said suddenly to Mrs. Medlock. You'll know just by looking out the window in ten minutes, the woman replied. Before arriving at the manor. We still had five miles to drive through the miser heath. Because it's dark, you can't see much, but you can see something. Mary didn't ask any more questions but waited in the dark corner, her eyes always staring at the window. The car lights in the compartment cast wisps of light. Not far ahead of them, she caught a glimpse of their stuff passing. After leaving the station, they drove through a small village where she saw freshly painted cottages and the lights of public facilities. House. Then. They passed a church, a parsonage, and a small shop in the window of a cottage, where toys and sweets and other curious things were put for sale. Then they got onto the road and she saw hedges and trees. For a long time after that. It didn't seem to make any difference at least not to her for a long time. Finally, the horses began to slow down, as if they were climbing a hill, and there seemed to be no hedges or trees in front of them. In fact, she could see nothing but darkness on either side. Just as the carriage jolted violently, she leaned forward and pressed her face against the window. Mrs. Medlock said we must be in the wilderness now, said Mrs. Medlock. The car lights shed yellow light on a rough road. The path seemed to lead through bushes and low vegetation, 
ending in an endless expanse of darkness that was clearly in front of and around them. A gust of wind blew, making a strange, wild, low, and rapid sound. This this isn't the sea, is it? Mary said, looking around at her companions. No. No, answered Mrs. Medlock. It's neither fields nor mountains, just a vast expanse of moorland with nothing growing but heather, tulip trees, and brooms. Nothing but wild horses and sheep. Aye, it feels like the sea. If anything Mary said it sounded like the sound of the sea. It was the sound of the wind blowing through the bushes, said Mrs. Medlock. It seems to me a desolate and dreary place, but there are many people who like it, especially when the heather is in bloom. They kept driving in the dark, and although the rain stopped, the wind whistled and made strange sounds. The road went up and down, and the carriage passed a small bridge several times. The water under the bridge was rushing and making a loud noise. It seemed to Mary that the drive would never end. The vast, desolate wasteland was like a vast black ocean, and she was traveling across a dry land. I don't like this, she said to herself. I don't like it, she pursed her thin lips tighter. When she saw the light for the first time. The horse is climbing a hilly road. Mrs. Medlock saw it too, and breathed a long sigh of relief. Well, I'm glad to see those little lights twinkling, she exclaimed. That's the light from the cabin window. Whatever. We'll have a nice cup of tea in a little while. As she said, after a while, for after the carriage passed through the park gate, there were still two miles of avenues to drive through, and the trees, almost touching their heads. It feels like you are driving through a long dark vault. They drove out of the vault and came to a clearing, stopping in front of a long but low house that seemed to stretch endlessly around a stone courtyard. At first, Mary thought there was no light at all in the window. But as she stepped out of the carriage, she saw a dim light shining in a corner room upstairs. The gate was made of huge oak boards with strange shapes, covered with large iron nails and tied with large iron bars. It leads to a huge hall, which is dimly lit. The faces in the portraits on the walls and the figures in the armor made Mary feel like she didn't want to look at them. As she stood on the stone floor she looked like a very small, eccentric little black man, and she felt as small, lost, and eccentric as she looked. A neat and tidy person. The thin old man stood next to the footman who opened the door for them. You take her back to the room, he said in a hoarse voice. He doesn't want to see her. He's going to London tomorrow morning. Very well, Mr. Pitcher, said Mrs. Medlock. I vowed, as long as I know what is expected of me, I can do it. Mrs. Medlock, all you have to do, said Mr. Pitcher, make sure he's not disturbed, and make sure he doesn't see anything he doesn't want to see. And then... Mary Lennox was led up a wide staircase, down a long corridor, up a short flight of steps, through another corridor, and through another corridor, to a door in the wall. When the door opened, she found herself in a room with a fire. Dinner is on the table. Mrs. Medlock said unceremoniously. Okay, you're here. This room and the next room are where you will live and you must abide by them. Don't forget it. Mistress Mary this is how I came to Misselthwaite Manor. Perhaps she had never felt so at odds in her life. Chapter 4 Martha Early in the morning, when she opened her eyes, a young maid was walking into her room to light a fire, and was kneeling on the stove, noisily stirring the coals. Mary lay on the bed and watched her for a moment, then began to look around the room. 
She had never seen a room like this before and found it both curious and eerie. The walls were hung with tapestries embroidered with forest scenes. There were strangely dressed people under the trees, and the castle's turrets could be glimpsed in the distance. There are hunters, horses, dogs and ladies. Mary seemed to be in the forest with them. Looking out of a deep window she could see a vast expanse of climbing land that seemed treeless and looked like an endless, dull, purple sea. What is that? She pointed out the window and said. Martha, the young maid who had just stood up, looked at her and pointed out. Is it there? She said. Yes. That's the wilderness, he smiled kindly. Do you like it? No, Mary replied, I hate it. That's because you're not used to it, said Martha, returning to the fireside. You think it's too big and bare now. But you'll like it. Mary asked, really? Yes, I think so, Martha replied cheerfully, wiping it. Stove. I love it. It's not bare. There are things growing everywhere and they smell sweet. It's lovely here in spring and summer when gores, brooms and heathers are in bloom. It smells of honey, the air is fresh, the sky is high, and bees and larks chirp sweetly. Well, I won't leave the wilderness no matter what. Mary listened to her with a serious expression and doubts. The local servants she was used to in India were not like this at all. They were fond. They paid tribute to them, calling them protectors of the poor and other such titles. Indian servants were ordered to do things, not required to do them. People were not used to saying, please, and thank you, and Mary always hit her aya in the face when she got angry. She kind of wanted to know. What would this girl do if someone hit her in the face? She was round, rosy, and kind-hearted, but she had a resolute character that made Mistress Mary wonder whether she would not even slap back if the person who slapped her was just a little girl. You are a strange servant, she said rather haughtily, rising from her pillow. Martha stood up on tiptoes, holding a black pen in her hand, and smiled, without seeming to lose her temper at all. Yeah. I know, she said. If Missile White. I wasn't even supposed to be one of the maids. I might be appointed or maid, but I would never be appointed upstairs where I'm too common and talk too many Yorkshires. But this is an interesting house, yet so grand. There seems to be no owner. Nor did Mr. Craven, except Mr. Pitcher and Mrs. Medlock, bother me about anything in his presence, which was almost always absent. Mrs. Medlock gave me the place out of kindness. She told me she could. If Misselthwaite was like any other big house, I wouldn't do it. Will you be my servant? Asked Mary, still in her haughty little Indian way. Martha began to wipe her grate again. I am Mrs. Medlock's servant, she said firmly. She belongs to Mr. Craven, but I have to do a maid's job here and have to wait on you for a while, but you don't need much service. Who will dress me? Mary asked. 